SN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. It's Kerry Lutz here, and the worst is about to happen. You probably heard about that bank in Austria. No bailout for you. The Austrian government has basically washed their hands and said bail-in time is here, and that's not Miller time. And, well, John Rubino over at dollarcollapse.com, co-author of that best-selling Amazon book, The Money Bubble, is about to weigh in on it because it's Monday, March the 2nd, if you can believe it. John, hey, happy March. Hey, Kerry. Happy March right back at you. Yeah, so bail-ins, they're now becoming a reality. The interesting part is uh, this bail-in that you uh, informed me about, uh, they're not asking the depositors to chip in their fair share yet, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's an Austrian brand bank, and I'm going to guess that the pronunciation of its name is HETA, H-E-T-A, Asset Resolution Corp AG. And um, it was nationalized in 2009 when it collapsed in the wake of the, the financial crisis, and it was recapitalized by the government. They pumped a lot of new money into it. And, uh, and so since that time, its bonds have traded basically like treasury bonds. You know, they were they're trading above par. Their, their yield was uh, was attractive enough to uh, to bring in a lot of capital. Lots of people wanted to own their bonds because they assumed this bank was, uh, you know, basically part of the government, guaranteed by the government. And um, but in the wake of the new uh, strategy for dealing with banks that blow up, which is the bail in strategy where everybody associated with the bank has to take a hit, um, this bank just blew up over the weekend. And the government has decided to let it go. They're going to unwind it, which means they're going to just uh, cash out all the assets and and uh, and make the bondholders um, cover the difference, whatever it turns out to be between what the bank owes and what it makes on its asset sales. And it turns out it's probably going to be a pretty big hit. The bonds are, are where they were trading above par before. Now they're trading about 50 cents on the dollar. So the, the bonds of this bank have tanked. And the owners of these bonds are, are therefore going to have to book big losses at some point in the future. And the credit default swaps on those bonds are going to be activated, which means uh, whoever has insured these bonds payments will have to pay up and make good on it. So now you've got a, a losses spread out throughout the financial system. And we will find out over time as the, the people who have to take these losses have to report those losses uh, in, in their next quarterly statement or whenever it is that they end up having to take the losses. So there's a lot of um, layman moment speculation out there now with people saying, is this, is this the change in the, uh, the nature of the market? that uh, is going to cause some kind of a systemic crisis. Because back in 2008, uh, we were bailing out Wall Street right and left and, and making good all the bondholders and, uh, and everything, so, and keeping things at bay until layman's problems came along. And the US government decided just to let layman go bankrupt. And that terrified everybody. And then the markets really started to tank. So the question is, is this um, the beginning of something like that, where all of a sudden we recognize that bank stocks and bank bonds aren't actually parts of the government? They're not guaranteed by the central bank and they won't automatically be bailed out if there's any kind of a problem. And so maybe we have to actually look at the risk levels of these institutions and adjust our uh, asset valuations accordingly. And, uh, and if we have to do that, then, you know, Greek bonds, Spanish bonds, Portuguese bonds, French bonds, Italian bonds, all of these things, are they're not like treasury bonds. They're not guaranteed to pay you back if they're not backed up by the European Central Bank. And so we would have to reprice all of these bonds and they would have to yield a lot more and these governments would have to pay a lot more to borrow. And uh, it, it would be the nightmare scenario for the Eurozone and by implication for the rest of the world. So uh, I don't think they'll let it <clears throat> get to that. I think they will end up um, giving up on this whole bail-in idea after they see the uh, the results of it. But we're heading into the process of them finding out what the results are. So it could be really choppy and interesting going forward. Yeah. And... The problem is it's like a controlled burn when you're having a to try to avoid a forest fire. 
And you never know when that control burn is going to get away from you and you have a mass conflagration, right? Yeah, because b- basically what could happen is that everybody starts looking around um, for who's next, you know, and they find a lot of candidates. And so a lot of other banks start being sold off. Their equities tank, their their bond yields spike, and, and they become non-viable because of that. All of a sudden they can't borrow anymore. You know, if you're a bank, you need to be able to borrow money in order to lend it out at a higher rate. If you can't do that, you stop functioning as a bank. And so that's the danger. You know, it, um, one bank failing leading to a lot of other banks failing. It's just a, you know, classic bank run. And that has happened many times in financial history. And it's always a danger in a fractional reserve banking system because everybody knows that these banks don't, <clears throat> they don't have all the money that they need in their vaults, right? They've, uh, they've lent out vastly more than they have on hand. And so if people don't want to do business with them anymore, they just instantly fail. And so that's the thing the governments of the world now have to watch for and prevent. And, you know, obviously the, the, um, the end game here is a return to taxpayer funded bailouts using newly created currency. And then the pressure goes back on currencies. You know, we, we stop um, thinking that uh, the currencies are fine because the private sector is going to have to eat whatever losses happen in the private sector and and return to the days of all the big companies being guaranteed by all the major governments um, and the central banks being obligated to just produce enough new currency to cover everything. you know, And then you start worrying about the value of the currencies. So that's where we'll end up. But how we get from here to there is the interesting part, because we don't know if this is a layman moment or if it's just a blip. And what really matters now is what happens to the next bank. You know, do the markets look around and find somebody else that they think is a prime target and then crash that institution? And right now, it, it, um, <clears throat> it isn't clear that it's happening. There's no new name popping up anywhere. So we'll, we'll see what comes of this. But it's, you know, it's an indication of where we're headed. Because remember where this is. This is Austria, which is a, a relatively financial sound country. And if one of their banks can blow up, then uh, what does that mean for Spanish banks that have just massive bad debts that have been, uh, uh, you know, funded and carried by the government over the past few years? Or Greece, which is still a basket case and being bailed out, or Italy, which has um, government debt as a, as a percent of GB, GDP at the second highest level next to Japan uh, of anybody out there. So there's a lot of potential targets for the the speculators of the world to sell off. And uh, the question now becomes, do they get activated by this? Do they start looking around for who's next and start really uh, uh, crushing some of these uh, bank bonds? And we'll see, you know, if if not this time around, it's coming, you know, uh, we we owe so much and um, the the financial structures of Europe and Japan and and to an extent the US right now are so fragile that somebody's gonna blow up and cause a, a contagion. We don't know when it'll be, but this is how it will look when it starts, you know, this will what this will be what the first thing looks like, and then we move on to the second thing, and that's the question: Does it happen this week or uh, or two years from now? It's a chipping away, effectively, right, of the veneer of stability, and that's what you really have to be worried about. Yeah, it, this one's relatively small, manageable, assuming that the derivative thing doesn't really get out of hand, right? Well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a chipping away um, until the whole edifice falls. Mm-hmm. And so when, when it falls, it'll happen pretty much instantly. You know, everybody will start looking around. They'll find instead of just one likely candidate for the next blow up, they'll find 30. And then the whole system spins out of control because there's no way to put out that many fires. You know, to go to go back to your, your fire break analogy with one fire, you can kind of manage it. But if you've got a, a fire blowing in from one direction and another one springing up in front of you and, and uh, you get a call that the, the mountain next to you is totally on fire and could you go over there and help? But no, you've got to put out these fires. You know, that's that's the kind of situation when things spin out of control because the, the central banks, which are, are capable of handling, handling one thing at a time, can't handle five things at once. And so then um, we get 2008 again, where we're a day away from martial law. Only this time, instead of just the U.S. banking sector, it's the, the whole world, you know, the Eurozone and, and uh, Japan and possibly China and definitely the U.S. You know, we all blow up at once, once these banks start going. And so that's what we're looking at at some point. And the, uh, the question is just one of timing. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's, it's kind of 
yeah, if they do manage to just keep it contained for right now, it's just a matter of time till a big bank really blows up. And then how do you stop it? Right. It's just just a matter of time. Yeah. Well, I, I, but you can stop the, the one big bank that blows up, but you can't stop the 20 that come next um, if you don't do a good job on the first bank. And so what Europe is doing now is trying a, a new technique for managing a, a bank blowing up. You know, in the past, they just printed enough new euros to uh, to recapitalize the bank that was going bust. And that was it. You know, and, and so as long as the euro held up, they could keep doing that um, as many times as they wanted to. And uh, that carried some political risk. In other words, it was hard to get reelected when you're using taxpayer money to bail out these big, rich bankers. You know, people don't buy that. And so you lose votes. And they made the calculation that they, they were on the verge of losing a critical mass of votes and letting the anti-Euro parties win. You know, and, and, and that's already beginning to happen. You know, you've got Podemos in, in Spain that um, is leading in the polls. You've got uh, National Front in France, which is anti-Euro and also leading in the polls. And interestingly, Podemos is of the left and, and National Front is of the right. You know, so you've got anti-Euro people on both sides of the political spectrum squeezing the middle. And so the, uh, the Eurozone officials have decided that they, they can't risk using taxpayer money going forward to bail out banks. And so now they're gonna try putting the, uh, the onus on the, uh, the stakeholders. So the workers are going to get laid off. Stockholders are going to take a massive hit. Bondholders are going to take a pretty big hit. Credit default swaps are going to be hurt. And, and we'll see how that plays out. They, they haven't tried it on any scale yet. So this is the first big test, which is why it's so interesting. Because if it, if it works and this bank is, <clears throat> is bailed out in that way, then all of a sudden bank stocks and bank bonds are a whole different proposition for the markets with possible destabilizing uh, consequences. And if it doesn't work, then they have to go back to the old way of using newly created currency, in other words, taxpayer money, to bail out everybody in sight and then suffer the political consequences. So there, this is a rocky road either way it goes. And the question is, who are going to be the main players? You know, who's going to be the threat to the status quo going forward? Either it's voters or it's bondholders and hedge funds. And, uh, you know, we'll see. I don't know. It's scary no matter how you figure it, right? It really well, is. from... From the point of view of the uh, the guys trying to maintain the status quo, yeah, yeah, because they, they've got basically an impossible job. They've got an unsustainable status quo, which if they actually are not brain dead, you know, they know they know what they're dealing with and they know the risks. So, yeah, I, I would have trouble sleeping if I was one of the guys in charge of making policy for the Eurozone right now or for Japan or for China or the U.S. or for many other countries. You know, it's, it's an impossible situation. And whatever happens, you get blamed for the consequences. And there are lots of articulate people pointing out your mistakes, but you don't know ahead of time what's a mistake and what's not, because you're, you're in a situation where nothing is guaranteed to work and it's possible that nothing at all can work. And so you're just kind of flying blind. You don't have any economic theory that, that explains what's happening. You, you certainly don't have any tools that are guaranteed to work the way, um, you know, easy money used to be. It used to be, you know, there's a little bit of trouble. You cut interest rates dramatically and the markets respond to that and, and everything picks back up. So you have a hard year, but you get out of it and you, uh, you eventually get um, credit for fixing things, even though you might have been one of the people who broke them in the first place. That's not a guarantee anymore because there doesn't seem to be any way to guarantee a fix. You know, there's nothing you can use that, uh, that you can say, well, two years from now, it's highly likely that things will be okay no matter how tough they are right now <laughs> and uh, yeah. and so yeah you know it, it must be hard to sleep for these guys if they actually understand what it is they're dealing with oh you know that uh, well these guys don't have any problems sleeping no matter what's on the line right they, they seem to enjoy their jobs they they like the power and uh, and they like the prestige and i think for them that's that's a big part of the job. You know, the, the policy stuff is just what you do in the daytime before you go out to the cocktail party where everybody comes up and wants to know you, you know? <laughs> and uh, so this is how they get through their days in order to live their real lives, which is uh, as a, uh, a rich, powerful bureaucrat that sits above the, the entrepreneurs and, the, uh, and everybody else, basically, of the world and the social hierarchy. You know, they, they love this, but they've reached the 
point where their past mistakes are coming back to haunt them and they may not be able to maintain this nice lifestyle for very much longer. So most of them, you know, from their point of view, it's not a complete disaster because they're pretty old. You know, by the time they get to where they're, they're running the Eurozone or whatever, ever, they're in their late 50s, early 60s. So they're just a few years away from retirement. So if they can manage to hold things together for two or three more years, they get to retire rich and uh, and whatever happens after their successors get blamed. Yeah. So Someone they can say, well, you know, <laughs> you know, it was fine when we were there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's that's what Alan Greenspan has gotten to do in the U.S. And that's what Ben Bernanke is getting to do. These guys are, are still doing high prestige work. You know, they still get uh, get to charge a lot for speeches and, and they get challenged every once in a while. But um, uh, they, they in general, in most places are still considered smart people who did a good job of running the country. And so I think the guys running the Eurozone right now have that same goal in mind. You know, they, they want to be up and out before everything blows up, knowing that it's going to blow up, but uh, not knowing the timing. That's the game for them. Can they keep it going until they leave and are replaced by somebody else who's, who will be left holding the bag? Yeah, well, that's the beauty of it. It always pays to go out on top. Greenspan was the smartest. Bernanke, not so smart. He got in there <laughs> right when things were really hitting the fan. And it was just by a quirk of fate that the whole thing didn't melt down. And somebody was saying to me, well, why didn't we just let the whole thing blow up? And for the government to just sit back and let a situation that they created vis-a-vis -vis the, the uh, alchemistic creation of central banking, not a possibility. But the bail-in, and I use the bail-in with the exception of of the depositors where you allow the equity holders and the creditors of the banks to pay for the bailout. And then you hold the management accountable as well as the people in the central banks and the government who basically made the whole uh, field fertile for these abuses. All of them should be held accountable. None of them ever will, ever were and ever will be. You know, that's really the problem. Instead, it's defined as a flaw in capitalism, capitalism winding up with its natural conclusion. This is what always happens when capitalism runs amok. But you and I both know, John, that this is anything but capitalism that led to this series of events, right? Yeah. What, what people don't seem to get is that failure is a, a crucial, maybe the crucial part of capitalism. You have to have big highly public, um, very scary corporate failures for a capitalist system to work, because that's the object lesson. That's what tells you how far you can go. So when one big company blows up, when one bank goes bust and is allowed to go bust and its stockholders lose everything and its executives are thrown out of work and, and its bondholders take a massive haircut, you know, when that happens, then all the other banks say, oh, okay, well, the, I guess we won't leverage ourselves 30 to one after all, you know, because look what happened to Citigroup. We won't let that happen to us. We'll, we'll scale back our leverage. We will operate conservatively. And so the system works when you have stuff like that going on all the time. You know, you need a big failure every few months to hold the, uh, the excessive greed of capitalism in check. Because what, what capitalism does is, is it harnesses our natural greed, you know, our natural self-interest, our natural selfishness, our natural greed, and channels it into socially beneficial behaviors. But if you don't have any kind of a limit on that, then we just spin out of control. You know, we're naturally corruptible entities, human beings are. Yeah. And see, to control the, the potential corruption, you have to have object lessons out there. You have to have somebody who's in the headlines showing you what the results of corruption are. And what we've done in the past couple of decades is short-circuited that process because every time there's a little bit of trouble, the politicians in the central bank step in and bail everybody out. So the lesson now is that you should take the biggest possible chances in the hope that if you get through the year by taking these huge chances, leveraging yourself to the hilt, you know, selling exotic, untested instruments to naive pension funds or whatever, um, and basically lying about everything that you're doing. And uh, if you can make it through the year and book massive profits, you as the executive who did that get a huge bonus. And nobody's going to take that away from you. You know, the government, if, if your bank gets in trouble, the government will bail you out, keep you in your job and let you keep the bonuses 
losses that you generated by taking all these excessive risks. And so naturally, you get a system that has completely spun out of control because there, there's no limit now on the natural greed of the guys in charge. And so they're just rolling the dice. That's that's now what banking is. It's, it's basically running a hedge fund if you're running a big bank. Because the, the higher the risk level, the higher the potential reward, the bigger your bonus. And the downside is basically zero. I mean, you there's a little bit of turmoil if your bank gets into trouble, but the government steps in, bails you out, and then you pay a record bonus at the end of the year for all your people hanging in there, you know, which is what Wall Street has done. So yeah, you know, it's it's not capitalism anymore because it's missing the, the crucial component of capitalism. Uh, isn't it wonderful? That's what yeah. it's all devolved into is a risk that the taxpayer share and the uh, the profit that the private sector gets to share. And that is not capitalism. And that's what it's so important that you need to understand is that we're not in capitalism. That is, that is anti-capitalism, crony capitalism, whatever you want to call it, not capitalism, right? Just yeah. Well, it's, it's state socialism basically, or, or socialism for the rich, because they're, they're the ones who get bailed out. And regular people tend to bear the brunt of whatever happens. You know, the, the job market in the U.S. Is, uh, is, has been horrible. You know, there aren't, there aren't good jobs like there used to be. Gary, when you and I grew up, um, if you were 19 or 20 and you didn't have to be very well educated, but you had to be just physically healthy and active, you could just walk into a job in a factory. You know, you just show up at the door and they say, oh yeah, okay, we need somebody, grab that wheelbarrow there, you know, and, 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 there's, and then when we graduated with decent educations, later in our 20s, uh, there were finance jobs everywhere and the publishing industry was cooking. You know, there were lots of, uh, of places where you could just step into a job that was um, three or four years down the road gonna pay you six figures. There's very little like that anymore. And so, so regular people are paying the price for what has happened in the, uh, the financial markets. Meanwhile, the rich keep on getting richer. So, yeah. And, and so, so now the guys in charge are really worried about people figuring this out. Yeah. And so they're, they're trying to figure out what to do next because they can't get away with just bailing out everybody in sight. And that's what these bail-ins are all about. Uh, that this is a, a new tactic for trying to keep voters from throwing them out of office yeah. and figuring out that the whole thing is a scam. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, if it were to work, if we weren't so over indebted now, this kind of thing would actually be the right way to go because then you let banks go out of business and, and you let rich people lose money yeah. and then everybody else learns the lesson from that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But to see that that's not, is not what's happening. So no, not at all. Not, couldn't be further from the truth. It's, uh, it's the system is made to protect those who have an interest in it and screw everybody else uh, if you are not uh, wealthy enough or powerful enough to, to hook the uh, ruling elite and the politicians to protect you. And that's really the problem. And on that note, we got to run, but uh, find John's work over at dollarcollapse.com. Check out his book, The Money Bubble, because it's all happening right in accordance with the, the plan or the, uh, the expectation, the forecast outlined in The Money Bubble. And check us out at financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Got a couple of great webinars coming up really soon, like in the next three weeks. And John, we will catch up with you next week. Have a good week ahead. Thanks. You too, Carrie. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.